So I'm Antonio Fataz, professor of economics at INSEAD. I've been teaching and doing research at INSEAD for the last 25 years, and my interests are in macroeconomics, and in particular about the effects of digital technologies on financial markets and central banks. So digital money is something that we've had for a long time, even if we didn't call it digital money, because when we use our bank accounts to do payments, whether you use a check, whether you use a credit card or a debit card, the sum record that is sitting on a computer, on a server of a bank, that gets changed to transfer the balance from your account to the account of the merchant where you buy your goods. So that has been there for a long time, for many years. Credit cards have been around for decades. But what has happened recently is that we've had a set of innovations that has made it more possible for other forms of digital money to appear. And these are forms that appear on your phone as an electronic wallet or sitting in a company which is not a bank. And that's why we're talking a lot more about digital money today than we were talking a few years ago. So digital money obviously is a form of payment which is a lot more efficient than the traditional, if you want, more physical forms of payments, which are typically banknotes or even checks. Checks do rely on your bank balance, but at the same time you have to write it on a piece of paper and they need to go from the merchant to the bank, back to the other bank. Digital money in principle can allow for payments which are immediate, not only immediate, but they also can be costless. So we're looking at efficiency, we're looking at convenience, which in payments is something that I think everyone would like. I think digital money itself and the developments that we're seeing these days are sort of a small steps on the payment system, but it just happens to be that the payment system is very central. All the transactions, all the purchases of goods and services, any monetary transaction involves a payment. So even if you're changing a layer, which is not that big, it's a layer that affects everyone. And because it affects everyone, you have what economists call network effects. So if you start sending money to your friends using your Facebook account, now everyone is more motivated to use that form of payment. And at some point we become, we see a large shift in people, customers from one platform to another, even if what you're changing is fairly small. So I think that's what makes payments so important. It's not so much how large the innovation is, which might not be that large, it's more the network effects that are generated by the fact that payments are everywhere. So digital money itself and payments is not something that is being transformed in a large steps. It's changing and it's becoming more efficient, it's becoming costless, and it's appreciated by everyone. It seems like a small innovation, but what happens if payments are everywhere? In every transaction you do, you have some form of payment, and this creates what economists call network effects. If there is a new ecosystem, a new method of payments, let's say associated to your WhatsApp account or your WeChat account, if you start using it, all your friends would like to use it as well. And then we see this large migration of customers, in some cases away from banks, toward these other solutions. So that's when you see a big disruptive movement. It's not so much that your life changes so much when it comes to payments, but it's that we all move to platforms and ecosystems that might be different from the traditional payment systems that typically relied on banks. So the, the size of the change that we're seeing, it really depends on the markets that you're thinking. There's the some regions where the change is really, really fast, in particular in Asia. And that's because the traditional banks were not as established as in other countries. If you compare the Asian banking system with the European or the American, it was sort of lagging behind. So you had these new players, the, the biggest players have been WeChat and, and uh, Alipay that have sort of taken over the market using these new technologies and have taken a space that normally would be occupied by banks. So if you are sitting in Asia, the change is really, really large and it's visible. If you are in Europe or the US, you see more incremental changes because banks are well established and it's very difficult to move people away from banks in a short period of time. Well, Libra is just another solution for digital money, like many other. There's plenty of startups that have proposed things that look like Libra. What Libra brings is this effect of coming with an ecosystem, which is the Facebook, WhatsApp, Instagram ecosystem, which is used by many people. And if you manage to move all those people to a payment system, which is also controlled by the same company, 
then it means that it creates sort of a monopoly, not only when it comes to your social media account, but also when it comes to the payments. That's why the reaction to Libra has been so strong. We've seen proposals which are very similar in the past with limited reaction from governments and regulators, but now you have a big player, Facebook, even if there is a lot of companies around Libra, but Facebook is the leader, proposing a solution that potentially could drag a large number of payments to their platform. Now, will Libra replace the dollar and other traditional currency soon? I don't think so. It might happen one day, but it's going to take a lot of time and probably a lot of changes to the current architecture of the financial system. The reason is that these currencies, the traditional currencies, are very well established. You have the governments, the central banks, the regulators behind them. They're not ready to give up their own currencies, and they obviously control the financial system. It's very hard for the financial system to sort of disappear as it exists today without the regulators changing the rules. And as long as the regulators are in place, and they're going to be in place for a long time, we're going to see sort of a, a bias towards the status quo by regulators. They don't want to change things too much, and they're going to do whatever they can to protect the current players. They're going to allow for innovation, but it's always going to be innovation that is going to be marginal. They will not allow, certainly today, a replacement of the traditional currencies by Libra. So I think governments and regulators have woken up to the reality of digital money with the announcement of Libra. I think before they were paying attention to it, they were doing their own experiments to see where this world was taking them to. But with Libra, they've seen sort of a true competitor to the traditional currencies. And now they've put together a set of work groups to try to come up with a framework to think about these solutions. Before, they had sort of half answers to how is it that we're going to regulate these new forms of digital money. What they've said now is everyone stops. We're not going to allow things like Libra to happen until we figure out what the framework will be. So that's the current situation. We're going to have to wait a few, hopefully, months to come up with a framework that will say from the regulatory point of view, we're going to allow this and this, but we're gonna, not going to allow any other form of digital money. So among regulators, you have sometimes some that are trying to be a little bit more innovative and more open to, to some of these new forms of digital money. In particular, for example, Switzerland or Singapore are regulators that are allowing some of this to happen at a speed that the other regulators are not allowing. Now, why is it that they're doing it and, and others like the Europeans or the Americans are not doing it? I think both of these countries have an interest in maintaining some competitive financial activity in their economies. And they understand that given their size, that they want to attract some of these new players. In the case of Europe or the US, that incentive is not there. Uh, I mean, there's obviously a a lot of financial activity in both of these regions, but they don't need that much to attract these small players. So I think that's why you see differences in approach. At the same time, when you hear these regulators talking to each other, I think they sort of speak the same language. So fundamentally, they have the same views. On the margin, some of the small countries that want to attract more of this fintech activity, there's being more flexible. But I think fundamental to the big questions, I think they have the same answers.